This current series of messages has been one of the most difficult ever for me to prepare. The topics we will be discussing in the next three sermons have been chosen either because people have specifically asked me to talk about them or because I have sensed that the subject is one that would be important enough for, the, for our congregation to be challenged to think about them. The reality of living in this world is that we are not free from problems. Furthermore, while being a follower of Jesus Christ can do a great deal to mitigate many of the issues that we face in life, it will never eliminate all of the pain, suffering, and anguish that we face. What our faith in Jesus can do is to provide a perspective and a worldview which gives meaning and hope to what might otherwise seem like a senseless and hopeless situation. I've titled this series, Out of Balance. I chose that title because when we are facing many of the challenges that we're going to be talking about, depression and anxiety, familial strife and poor health, it's because there are things in our life that are not as they should be. Those situations may not necessarily be by any fault of our own, but nonetheless, there is something about our life which is not as God has designed it. There is something that's off kilter so that we are, we are not experiencing the peace of God that is promised in the scriptures. When the Old Testament speaks of peace, it uses the Hebrew word shalom. Now, the English word peace does not convey the full meaning of that word. The website for Jews for Jesus says the following about shalom. The ancient concept of peace rooted in the word shalom meant wholeness, completeness, soundness, health, safety, and prosperity, carrying with it the implication of permanence. When those things are not present in our lives, we are out of balance. It is God's desire for each and every one of his children to live with his peace. We will never fully reach that point of being perfectly in balance until we are in the presence of the Lord. However, even while we are on earth, it is God's desire that we experience that condition of shalom as much as is possible. Therefore, there is a need for us to address those conditions and situations which leave us out of balance and failing to sense the reality of God's peace in our lives. Today, we will look at the issues of depression and anxiety. If we look at the statistics alone, we learn that it is an overwhelming problem. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental condition, mental health condition in the United States, with over 40 million people suffering from it. In 2013, 34.4 million Americans took antidepressant drugs. That is more than the population of Indiana, Illinois, and Ohio combined. That was up from 13 million in 1999, which is nearly triple the number. A study from 2018 said that 25 million Americans have taken antidepressant drugs for two years or longer, and that is a 60% increase from 2010. It is estimated that 322 million people worldwide experience depression. The actual numbers of people dealing with depression and anxiety are certainly significantly greater than the published statistics, since those statistics only include those cases in which an individual seeks help, is diagnosed, treated, and then his case is entered into the databases. Furthermore, it likely does not include millions of cases of mild depression and anxiety in which people experience the same symptoms as more serious forms, but their ability to function is not seriously impacted, and therefore no treatment is sought. Virtually everyone must address the issue of anxiety and depression in one form or another. If not dealing with the condition personally, they have a loved one or a friend who is struggling. Depression and anxiety are, have far-reaching impact. These conditions are linked to suicide, damaged relationships, substance abuse, and the inability to function in society. 
Because of the enormity of the problem, I believe the Holy Spirit prompted me to take the time today to address this serious and important issue. As I said earlier, this message has been extremely challenging for me to prepare. I've listened to several sermons from other preachers who have tackled the issues of depression and anxiety. They seem to fall into two categories. In the one type, the message the preacher is giving is a list of verses telling the listeners to simply believe them and then claim them and everything's going to be all right. The implication would be that if you don't feel better after hearing those verses, most of these are verses which most mature Christians already know, that there's something wrong with your faith and your, with your relationship with God. The other type of messages tend to sound like an attempt to be a pop therapist and simply repeating the list of advice that anyone could get from a simple Google search without a lot of biblical content. Yet in each case, the sermons that I listened to had been recommended by others with glowing reviews saying how powerful and meaningful the messages were. In most cases, as I listened to these sermons, they were good and they were valuable, but not necessarily, in my opinion, so great to be given such overwhelming praise. I concluded that the reason people responded so well was simply because they wanted to hear someone particularly a spiritual leader. They didn't want to hear it from Oprah and they didn't want to hear it from Dr. Phil. They wanted to hear a spiritual leader addressing a very real problem which they or someone they know is dealing with. People just wanted to know that they weren't alone as they were going through this struggle. Now in today's message, I will be quoting verses to show God's will for our mental and emotional well-being. And I will encourage you to believe those words and to claim them as a reality in your life. And yes, I did several Google searches and I read books and literature from various organizations, Christian and secular, and I will give you some lists of advice of things to do to help if you are struggling with any of these issues. Now, actually, uh, we probably won't get those lists this morning because I have so much material here. That's some things that we're going to talk about during growth group this evening. But uh, I will be giving you that. That information will be available. As I discuss these things, I'm going to do something that I have done a few times in the past. You'll notice that there is a lectern down below the pulpit, and it's there for a purpose. Now, in many large contemporary churches, you will find that the preacher stands on stage and does not speak from a pulpit. Now, that, I suspect, is very intentional because in these megachurches, nothing happens by accident. Presumably, they did a market research study and discovered that people relate better to the speaker if he's not standing behind a barrier. And that's fine. If it helps people come and listen to the Word of God, that's great as far as I'm concerned. For me personally, however, I like the symbolism of a pulpit. Speaking from behind a strong, solid lectern sends the message that the words being spoken have authority and contain eternal truth. Therefore, during this message, I will deliver part of the sermon from here behind the pulpit when I'm sharing things that I am convinced is our eternal, unchanging, divinely revealed spiritual truths. I will also be sharing some thoughts, advice, and anecdotes which I believe are valuable but are not necessarily the authoritative word of God. And out of respect for sacred truth, I don't want to give the impression that my thoughts or information that I've picked up from non-biblical sources should be presented as scripturally based. Therefore, during the message, uh, there will be a period of time where I'm going to stand behind the lectern, the implication there being this is information that either I have, have from personal experience or that I've gathered from other sources, but th just take it for what it is. When I stand up here, I'm presenting what I believe to be the Word of God, and that's, that's the symbolism I see behind the pulpit. I also want to point out that I have a lot of material today. Now, our service officially ends at 1045, and if you have something going on you need to leave, feel free to go. You can just, at 1045, get up and leave. Um, I'm not going to try to go over too much beyond the formal time, but likewise, I want to make sure that I communicate all the information that I need to share. On the other hand, if you try to leave early, our ushers are going to put you in a hammerlock and guide you back to your seat. But at 1045, feel free, free, free to leave. 
11.45, yeah, you're right. It, that's right, yeah, at 11.45. Which, by the way, if I make those obvious mistakes, I, I said this earlier, point them out to me. A few weeks back when I said that Paul was uh, saved on the road to Antioch, nobody said anything until after the service, so... Don't be afraid. If I make some obvious mistakes, don't, don't have a problem correcting me. I don't have a problem with you correcting me. <clears throat> I will share some personal experiences at time, times, and sometimes I will be very clear and direct. Other times I'll speak in generalities, either because I'm not comfortable sharing some personal information or because the story involves others who have not given me permission to share that information. I will say at the outset, if there is anyone who has had no experience with depression or anxiety, and you have no idea about the things that I'll be talking about from any kind of personal experience, you immediately need to say a heartfelt prayer of thanksgiving for having been spared such suffering. Uh, I would say that described me until I was about 35 years old. I was blessed enough as a child, adolescent, and young man to be very stable emotionally, and I have no recollection of having serious bouts with sadness or feelings of despair. And consequently, it was hard for me as a young person to empathize with those who did have such feelings. I remember a time when uh, we were living in my hometown of Beloit, Wisconsin, after our first term as missionaries in the Philippines. So I was about 29 years old at the time. And we were visited then by a friend of ours who has a connection with this church, uh, Pastor Linda Lacus. And uh, Pastor Delacus was also very active in the ministry of Northern Grace Youth Camp, which uh, the, the, the church in Beloit sent their young people to that camp. And one of the young ladies, a teenager, that he had known through the camp had attempted suicide after breaking up with her boyfriend. The girl was actually, when, when uh, Lynn came to visit us, was in a mental health facility at that time. She was uh, there for about two weeks uh, with treatment. But... We went to visit the father and, and to offer him comfort. And as we were talking to the man, again, keep in mind I was about 29 years old, I was just thinking to myself, I couldn't imagine how anyone could get so upset to want to kill themselves over a breakup, over breaking up in a relationship. Now, most of you would be surprised that I wouldn't be able to understand that and wouldn't be able to, to uh, relate to that kind of emotion. But I was young, and as I said, that I was, I was blessed to not have those kinds of, of issues in my childhood and youth. Now, if you look at the statistics for teen suicide, it's very clear that I did have a special blessing because many young people do have to deal with those kinds of, of problems. Now, since then, I have had struggles and I have had to address some issues that so many others have, have felt, but without great severity. But I felt that I have had those experiences. I'm thankful for having had them because it has given me an opportunity to empathize with, with those going through similar situations, feelings that I would not have been able to, real, uh, uh, to relate to when I was a young man. So I, I'm actually thankful for having had to go through some of those uh, periods of sadness and despair and, and, um, uh, and loneliness. So we have to begin with understanding what it is we're talking about when we refer to depression. So the definition is this. Clinical depression is a mood disorder that causes distressing symptoms that affect how you feel, think, and handle daily activities such as sleeping, eating, or working. To be diagnosed with depression, symptoms must be present most of the day, nearly every day, for at least two weeks. In order for depression to have a clinical diagnosis, it must seriously interfere with your normal life functioning. And that's why I believe that depression is actually a much bigger problem than even the statistics indicate. Many people, I am convinced, live with mild depression, which was, does not seriously impact one's life and therefore is often not dealt with either clinically or even personally. People live in a continuous condition of melancholy, unhappiness and discontent, but because they can still go to work, they can take a shower, they can prepare meals, they can take care of their children and function normally, it goes unaddressed in their lives. 
Mental health experts talk about the concept of resilience and a person's response to depression or other mental health issues. It's similar to how everyone has different tolerances of pain, physical pain, where one person might faint if they get their fingerprint, finger pricked, someone else might get a pitchfork stuck in their hand, they'll just yank it out and keep on working. And the same is true with people dealing with emotional pain as well. Some have a higher propensity to just be able to buck up and push on, while others may not be able to tolerate the stress, and they simply stop doing the normal things that one has to do to carry on in a normal life. Now, the typical symptoms of depression are these. Prolonged or overwhelming feelings of sadness, emptiness, helplessness, or worthlessness. A person may no longer take pleasure in activities that they would normally enjoy. A person with depression may feel angry or guilty. Some may lack energy or enthusiasm for life. Often it's associated with sleeplessness. There may be dramatic weight gain or weight loss. Thoughts, in the most extreme cases, you would have uh, thoughts of suicide or actual suicide attempts. People uh, who have had depression commonly describe it as like feeling that you're in a dark cave or you're falling into a bottomless pit that you can't get out of. Uh, and it's very closely linked with substance abuse. Virtually everyone that has a substance abuse problem also is dealing with depression. They, they go together almost 100% of the time. So then we have to talk about the causes of depression. The actual causes of depression are quite complex and not entirely understood by psychologists, but there are certain factors that are typically linked with the condition. And this is where I feel that much of the preaching that I listen to about dealing with depression actually misses the mark. Most of the preachers that I heard associate the wrong thinking, which are symptoms of the depression and not the cause. And therefore they tell people to simply believe the scriptural truth and the depression is going to go away. If you feel unloved, there's a host of verses to remind us that God loves us, John 3:16. For God so loved the world, 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. Or Ephesians 1, 6, that tells us we are accepted into the beloved. If you feel worthless, well, just remember Luke 12, 6 and 7, that, um, that not one sparrow falls to the ground, but that he doesn't see them. He knows, every hair, uh, knows the very hairs on your head are all numbered and do not fear. You are of more value than many sparrows. Or if you feel helpless, Quote Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Now, I'm not minimizing the importance of emphasizing biblical truth to counteract the lies we tell ourselves when dealing with depression. We need to stop the wrong thinking because those thoughts feed upon themselves and they make a bad situation worse. And it creates this ever-worsening hole that we fall into. If a person believes the lie that he is worthless, those thoughts feed upon themselves and they create an ever-widening spiral of despair. Therefore, the lies that we tell ourselves need to be stopped if there is going to be healing. And those lies also need to be countered with biblical truth. However, while those thoughts may exacerbate the problem, they are usually not the cause of the depression. So here's where I'm going to step down and uh, just talk about some things, information that I've seen or what I've gathered from my life experience. The causes of depression are varied and complex. This uh, I, I say based on information that I've read and from various sources that I've come across over the years as well as from observation and personal experience. Uh, dealing myself with mild depression, as I discussed earlier, or interacting with others who have, have had those kinds of conditions. There's considerable evidence that some cases of depression have genetic roots. In one sense, all depression has genetic roots because it comes because of the fall and because of Adam. 
So the very fact that we, that we don't live within, in that perfect state of peace is because of the, 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 the fall and because we've inherited those, that characteristic from, from our father Adam. However, there, it also appears that certain people have a genetic predisposition to depression and to other mental illnesses. Biochemical imbalances in the brain. Now this cause of depression is actually controversial since many would argue that this is also a symptom of other physical problems such as poor diet, lack of sleep, stress, or other environmental factors. However, this is the typical go-to diagnosis for most medical doctors and thus it's the reason why we have such extraordinarily high rates of antidepressant use in this country because our medical doctors are trained to uh, assume that, it, that it's a chemical imbalance and then to address that with, with uh, the antidepressant drugs. Personal health, and, personal health and lifestyle habits. One book that I read by a Christian author believes that this might be the primary reason that most people suffer with depression. This would include things such as poor diet, lack of exercise, lack of sleep, environmental toxins, and, and so forth. The author of the book that I referred to said that virtually everyone that he has ever treated with depression deals with a lack of sleep. And it's unclear which causes which, but most likely one tends to exacerbate the other. You can't sleep because you're depressed, and the more depressed that you get, the less you're able to sleep, and this just becomes an endless cycle that feeds upon itself. Social isolation. There is strong evidence that people who live alone and don't interact with others are more likely to deal with depression than those who are socially involved with other people. That's why even secular counselors will advise their clients to attend church. Even if they don't believe in God, they recognize that the church provides a ready-made community which will give people the opportunity to have that all-important contact with other people. Adverse circumstances. Uh, from my observation, these are probably the most common triggers that cause people to develop feelings of despair, hopelessness, lack of worth, and helplessness. These are often factors that are beyond our control, and the degree of impact that it has on any individual is related to that person's resilience. Some people can simply handle adversity better than others. This would include such things as serious and chronic health issues, loss of a job, financial problems, relationship difficulties, death of a loved one, and so forth. That when you're facing those things, they become overwhelming, and that leads into this cycle then of wrong thinking leading into feelings of depression. Stressful life and job situations. The unrelenting, intense stress that results, uh, that comes from a, a, a difficult job or a stressful job or from a, uh, problems that you're dealing with uh, in your personal life. This unrelenting stress results in the constant release of chemicals in the body, such as cortisol and adrenaline, which are valuable in certain circumstances and in, in small amounts, but when they are constantly present, they have serious negative repercussions on our physical and mental health. Toxic emotions such as anger, resentment, unforgiveness, and guilt. If you have those, if you're dealing with those kinds of things, they're going to take their toll and they're going to lead again to these, this bad thinking that then takes the, the form of depression. Past traumatic experiences, things such as uh, abuse or domestic violence, these kinds of things are also going to, are, are linked very closely with depression. Buying into a faulty worldview or value system. And this is where having a proper biblical perspective on reality is so important. And that's because so many people, including Christians, have built their life on the values of the secular world. The world says that you need to have wealth, status, influence, beauty, and a host of other superficial qualities. 
when we don't measure up to an unrealistic and essentially unattainable standard set for us by the world, we develop those feelings of worthlessness and helplessness and resentment and jealousy because we don't have the things that other people have. A purely secular worldview dictates really that no one has any worth. There is no individual worth. If you truly believe the things that you were taught in school about evolution and where we came from and those kinds of things, then you have no worth. It's only the survival of the species that matters. And unless you are an alpha individual that is going to significantly improve the gene pool, you serve no useful purpose in this world. And if you believe and buy into those lies and buy into that, that thinking, you are going to feel worthless. Given the purposeless perspective that the world offers, it's a wonder that there actually isn't more depression out there. Anyone who buys into the world's philosophies and the values that the world presents, if they aren't depressed, they should be. They're just not thinking about what the world is telling them. So as we see the, the causes of depression, at least as they're understood, are complex and varied, another factor that can cause depression is ongoing disobedience to God's will in our life. Now as I pointed out earlier, we were created to have peace with God, the scriptural concept of shalom, which is harmony and wholeness. That condition was disrupted and lost because of Adam and Eve's disobedience when sin entered creation. And that is why everyone, to some degree, experiences that lack of peace because of the, the fall and because of our, our, our sinful nature. Therefore, not every case of depression is because someone has some kind of unconfessed act of sin in their life. In fact, that's usually not the case. However, we will see that in certain circumstances that can be the reason why people would be dealing with depression because of sin. We will look at a biblical character who seems to have had to deal with depression based on the descriptions that we read. That character, the one character who probably showed the most obvious and classic symptoms was King Saul of Israel. Saul's early time as Israel's king was successful and the Lord blessed his rule over the nation. However, Saul's attitude changed and he became full of pride and he started to covet his power and his authority. Saul's situation deteriorated dramatically, however, after an incident in which he disobeyed God by offering sacrifices prior to a battle against the Philistines rather than waiting for the prophet Samuel to arrive as was agreed upon. And then we read in Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Whoops. What happened there? Oh, it went all, I, I hit the, sorry about that. Let's go back here. I have the keyboard down here and I just happened to touch it and it sent it flying to the end of the PowerPoint and then it wouldn't come back. Okay, so sorry for that. It's the first, first since we have had the, uh, this new computer and that wasn't the computer's fault at all. That was mine. That was human error. There we go. Okay. So, going back, Saul, uh, Saul had committed sin, and his, in, in general, is the specific sin of not waiting for, for Samuel to arrive to offer these sacrifices before the battle. But in general, he was developing a sinful, prideful attitude and a covetous attitude about his, uh, his role as the king. Now, there's disagreement about what that distress, distressing spirit from God was. 
It could be that God allowed a demonic spirit to torment Saul, or the word could be used not as a spiritual being, but more of as, as a state of mind, in the same way we might say that that person has a gentle spirit or a teachable spirit, and that we're not talking about an active entity, but more of a way of thinking. This might mean then that God sent a feeling of conviction into Saul's heart. In either case, what we do know is that Saul was dealing with depression because of sin. Ephesians 4.30 tells us, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now we grieve the Holy Spirit when we de deliberately disobey God's will. And just think of it, if God's Spirit that lives within us is grieved, how are we going to feel but grieved as well? And so we can see that one of the causes of depression can be active, unconfessed sin that, that we're not addressing in our lives. But again, I'm not saying that all depression is because of sin in our lives, but rather that it can be a cause of those feelings. And it would be wise, if you're dealing with that, to do an honest assessment of your hearts to see if there is something that needs to be repented of and cast away and so that, that uh, you are no longer grieving the Holy Spirit. Um, I also want to uh, uh, address this issue, another emotional condition, which is actually more common than depression, is anxiety disorder. Uh, and while considered a separate condition, it's closely related to depression. It might be, think of it as two sides of the same coin. A certain amount of apprehension and nervousness is natural and normal and healthy. We live in a dangerous world, and if we don't have a sense of the, the danger and the uncertainty of life, we would be living with significant risk. However, when that sense of apprehension escalates into persistent anxiety and irrational fear so that it interferes with our normal life functions, then it is labeled as a disorder. The causes of anxiety disorder likewise are complex, just like depression. Anxiety disorders are often related to an individual's temperament. Certain people are worriers, and if allowed to escalate, that predisposition then can become an, a disorder. Another very common reason for such conditions is exposure to trauma, either intense, isolated incidents or living with long-term, constant threats to safety and security, such as children who grow up in abusive households or women who are victim of, victims of long-term domestic violence, that, that as a result of that will often result in anxiety disorders. Now, God is fully aware that his children will deal with issues of depression and anxiety. And that's why we have so many words of hope and encouragement in the Bible. He knows that we need to be reminded frequently of his love and his care and his comfort, his provision, and the, rea the ultimate reality that God is in control when we feel as if life is out of control. So besides the, the scriptures of comfort and reassurance, the Lord has given us many examples of great men and women of faith who have had to deal with feelings of despair and hopelessness. Several important Bible figures who served God faithfully were subject to the types of emotions that many of us face today. And I want to take a few minutes just to, to take a look at some of those individuals. Job. Most of us know Job's story. He was one of the wealthiest men on earth. Everything was going well for him, and then he lost it all when God permitted Satan to take it away from him. He lost his family, his health, his possessions, everything, and then he reached this point of great despair. And he said this, May the day perish on which I was born, and the night in which it was said a male child is conceived. And may that day be darkness. May God above seek it, not seek it, nor the light shine upon it. May darkness and shadow of death claim it. May a cloud settle on it. May the blackness of the day terrify it. So we see uh, clearly, Job was in a, in a state of, of great despair, great despondency because of the circumstances he was in. Another important figure, and we see this from many of the Psalms that he wrote, David indicates that he had feelings of sorrow and despair frequently. He was constantly on the run before he became king, hiding from Saul. He felt threatened, he was under stress, he was not able to eat or sleep regularly, and consequently he felt hopeless and desperate. 
It says here, I am weary with my groaning. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with tears. My, eyes waste, my eye wastes away because of grief. It grows old because of all my enemies. And likewise, when David sinned with Bathsheba, there was this overwhelming sense of guilt. And here we have an example of depression caused because of sin. This is related to David's sin with Bathsheba. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds are foul and festering because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I, am, I go mourning all the day long. For my loins are full of inflammation and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and severely broken. I groan because of the turmoil of my heart. Elijah Immediately after this great spiritual victory he had over the prophets of Baal, Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life because of the threats of the queen Jezebel. And there in the desert he sat down and prayed and he was defeated and worn. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. And Jeremiah, one of the great prophets of Israel, and he prophesied about Israel's uh, apostasy. And he was the prophet that, that was uh, there to witness the destruction of Jerusalem. And, uh, and, he, and rather than, than the nation turning, against, uh, turning away from their sin, they turned against Jeremiah. And he writes this, Woe is me, my mother, that you have borne me, a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent for interest nor have men lent to me for interest. Every one of them curses me. Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable, which refuses to be healed? Will you surely be to me like an unreliable stream as water that fails? So here we see the, that even these men of God dealt with this, this, these feelings of, of, of despondency, these feelings of of, uh, of great depression. And yet, there is hope and healing. As I said earlier, freedom from the burden of depression for most people will be more than just reciting Bible verses and expecting all the feelings of sadness and desperation to evaporate. However, understanding what God has to say about the feelings that people with depression and anxiety deal with is an essential element to hope and relief. We must understand, first of all, our position in Christ and the promises of God to comfort and encourage us in times of difficulty before we will be released from this emotional pain. There are dozens of verses that offer hope and encouragement in the Scripture. My favorite, and the place that I direct people to go when dealing with any type of emotional pain, was our Scripture reading that we read earlier this morning, from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, which says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the suffering, you also will partake of the consolation. This passage reminds us that God is the God of comfort and that he wants us to feel his compassion. Furthermore, it lets us know that we go through difficulties so that we can be the instruments of his comfort. Notice he says that he says here, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. For if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Um, and it says, we go through, we, we are comforted by God so that we may in turn comfort others. We see that, that there is a purpose for the suffering and the pain that we experience. 
that as we go through those experiences, as we deal with those kinds of things, and as God then gives us peace as we work through these issues, then we then gain an empathy that we didn't have before that. As I was telling you earlier, when I was a young man, I simply could not understand the kinds of issues that people were dealing with. It just didn't make any sense to me. Uh, God had blessed me with such a temperament at that time in my life that, like, nothing fazed me. I, I, was, I was just, you know, steady as a rock. But life had a, has a way of kind of beating you down after time. You soften a little bit, and, and you, you know, you, you, it's just like when you take meat and tenderize it. You know, you, you beat that until it gets to a point where it's soft and, and chewable. And that's kind of what happens to, I think, to most of us. And then when you start experiencing those things, when you start having those feelings of sadness and worthlessness and, um, you know, just uh, all kinds of negative feelings, now you gain an empathy for those that are going through that that you may not have otherwise. And that's what Paul is saying here, is that we go through those experiences so that we can help others, so that we can share what we have learned from God with someone else. The next things we need to do, so first of all, just looking at these words of promise. You may have others. As I said, this is my favorite. You may have another passage of Scripture that is, uh, that is meaningful to you. And if you're able to come back tonight when we continue this discussion a little bit, uh, bring some of those verses. Bring some of the, the verses of encouragement that have helped you when you've felt some of those kinds of uh, experiences and felt, felt down like that. But we need to remind ourselves of our position in Christ. And these are truths that we need to go back to again and again when the recurring lies of Satan and the world are plaguing us in the middle of the night. What is our position in Christ? Who are we? We are saved and forgiven. We are loved by God. We are accepted in the beloved. We have a hope. We're not this, when it seems like it's hopeless, we know that as believers we have a hope. We are sanctified. We have, been, um, we have been made holy in God's sight. We don't have to worry about, uh, about the, the sin that, that has burdened us because we have been made holy as he looks upon us because of the righteousness of Christ. We are seated in the heavenlies and our citizenship is in heaven. When we're tempted to accept the worldview, the lies of the world's uh, perspective and the world's values, we remember that we are actually citizens of heaven. And we are just here as ambassadors for this period of time. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We take care of our bodies so that, uh, so that we can uh, function properly in, in, in the way that's going to uh, honor God. And we're part of the body of Christ. That we have a community that wants to help us. That wants to, that wants to come beside us and wants to lift us up through those those difficult dark times. So these are the things that we remind ourselves when all of these, these problems and when all of this despair uh, overwhelms us and takes, takes, takes control of our hearts. As I said, depression is associated with wrong thinking. The wrong thoughts may be the symptoms and not the cause or they may be the result, or they may, they may be causing, they may be feeding upon themselves and making a bad situation even worse. Or they may be the cause themselves. But nonetheless, we need to dispel those lies with the truth of God's word. And so I've put together a list of some of those lies that people dealing with depression uh, that come back and, and haunt them. Uh, when, they're, when these things are, when they're you know, not able to sleep at night or when they're alone or when these kinds of issues face them, these are the lies that, that keep being repeated in their head and what is the correct thinking and what's the scripture that we can go to that reassures us. So the first one is that of guilt or that I can never be forgiven. And the correct thinking is, of course, that Jesus Christ took our guilt upon himself. Now, for the Christian, guilt should not be part of your vocabulary. Guilt is the language of those under condemnation. It doesn't matter what we have done. When we place our trust in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, we have been forgiven and freed from the penalty, of the, of the penalty that we deserve for our sin. On the other hand, 
For someone who has never trusted in Christ, guilt should be all they feel. It doesn't matter if you lived a life like Mother Teresa, Mahatma Gandhi, and Albert Schweitzer combined. If you have not experienced justification and redemption that comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection to pay for your sin, you are guilty before a righteous and holy God. But for a believer, as Romans 8.1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. As I said, guilt has no place in the vocabulary of the believer. Now, another thing that seems like guilt, but is quite different, and that is remorse. And oftentimes people deal with the inability to let go of, of their past, this, this sense of intense remorse. The correct thinking is that God's grace empowers us to overcome whatever is in our personal history. Guilt, as I said, is something that Christians need not experience. However, an emotion that has a similar feeling to that is remorse. Remorse is the regret, contrition, and the grief one experiences for wrong actions. This is something that we all experience to some degree since we have all sinned. However, the intensity of those feelings of remorse will be proportional to the temporal consequences of our actions. This is going to be experienced by people who have very serious sins in their past. The person who has committed murder, rape, or robbery, a soldier who was forced to commit atrocities during battle, a woman who had an abortion and then came to the realization of what she had actually done. A person who's texting while they're driving and they didn't see the little kid run in front of them and ran over and killed her. That remorse comes when such things happen. The consequences of those things will never go away. The intensity, however, will diminish with time. Based on 1 Timothy 1, 13 and 14, it seems that the Apostle Paul never forgot nor stopped having remorse for his past sin. But likewise, he never ceased to be amazed and rejoice at the extravagant, outrageous grace of God that was able to offer him forgiveness and all the blessings of being an adopted child of God. So you can't undo the, the things that have happened and it's natural then to have that, that feeling of remorse. As time goes on, those things are going to, will diminish. That's kind of the nature of, uh, of how we deal with those kinds of things. It takes time, it takes grieving, it takes um, uh, just other life experiences to fill, fill in the gaps. But even then, when you're reminded of it, when it comes back to you, what you remember and what you think of is the amazing, incredible, fantastic, unbelievable, extravagant grace of God that forgave you. Look at what Paul says, and you know about his life. You know about his past and the things that he did. This was written late in his life. So you can see it was still on his mind. He had not forgotten his past. However, he says, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Another common problem that people deal with in depression is feelings of worthlessness. And of course, the correct thinking is that we are of infinite value to God. Feelings of worthlessness are among the most common emotions experienced by people with depression. And yet it is a complete denial of the entire basis of the gospel message that God loved us and we were of such importance that he sent his only son to suffer and to die on our behalf. You've heard that saying probably when you were in camp that was a common uh, thing that, that we would say during altar calls. If you were the only person alive, God would have sent Jesus Christ to earth to die for you. And that's how important you are. And so this idea of worthlessness is a denial of, of the gospel message of how important we are to God. And this is also where it is so important to embrace a biblical worldview. Because as far as the world is concerned, we are worthless. 
Our only value in the world is to the extent that we can help someone else make money or give them affection or provide our labor. And as soon as we can't offer any of those things, the world no longer wants anything to do with us. I mean, I, I used to think about this uh, when I worked uh, in, um, in social work. And uh, I worked in child welfare, but we worked hand in hand with the therapists. And the therapists would talk about, you know, would, they would get the clients and they would talk about how concerned they were for them and how much they cared for them and how much they, they want to help them. But then when their insurance ran out, oh, sorry, I can't see you today. You know, so that's, that's where you, you're going to send feel worthless and, and you're going to feel betrayed. Here's this person, you've, you know, for six weeks or whatever, you have, you have told them everything, you've invested everything, that you're given everything, told them everything, and then now when the insurance payments run out, they don't want to talk to you anymore. And so this is where we need to understand, we need to have this biblical perspective. A few scriptures that can help us, to help remind us of our, our, our worth to God. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of far more value than many sparrows. And Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Another wrong thought. Comparing ourselves to others based on the world's system. As I said earlier, accepting the world's values is a sure recipe to set oneself self up for depression. The marketers out there want you to believe the lies that you are not good enough and you don't measure up so that you have to buy their product. And you will be constantly comparing yourselves to the whitewashed updates that you see on social media. and say, I just, I, I'm just not as good as these people. Rather, what we need to embrace is the biblical perspective on life and a heavenly value system. We see what God says about this. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And Isaiah 55 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Other wrong thoughts, anger, resentment, and forgiveness, unforgiveness. And of course, the correct thinking is we need to let go of all of those toxic feelings. And we need to seek reco uh, reconciliation. The scripture says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. In Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, a few verses later, says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ Jesus forgave you discontent displeasure with life and unwillingness to accept the things that we cannot change to find contentment this is the, the right thinking is to find contentment in the Lord and to accept that what we cannot change we accept it and then find a way to glorify God in whatever situation we find ourselves in and Paul says this of course not that I speak in regard to need for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content Know how, I know how to be abased, I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Anxiety and fear. Of course, the, the correct thinking is we trust God's will and we give our anxious thoughts to the Lord in prayer. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Depression and anxiety are a part of our life because of the curse of sin. Yet God made us to find our completeness and our wholeness in Him. We are designed to be in perfect fellowship with our Creator. God has given us the promises that he will always be with us. And there is hope, and that hope is in Jesus Christ. While on earth, our Lord said this, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden 
is light. I just hope and pray that um, we could take these to heart, recognizing this is something that, that we deal with in life because of, because of Adam, because of the fall. A lot of reasons why these things come into our lives and why we experience them, why we feel these way, this way. But the reality, don't believe the lies, believe the reality. And then this afternoon or this evening when we come back, we're going to talk about ways that we can find help, things that, that we can do that are, that are both uh, uh, hopefully effective and consistent with, uh, with God and His will. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank You for this, this day that You've given to us. And Lord, we have to deal with these issues. This is what life is like. And yet you have given us so much hope. When we just look, looking through the scriptures, we just feel, see the abundance of comfort and reassurance and encouragement that you've provided for us there to remind us. And I pray that this